Good afternoon. It's one o'clock on Tuesday, February the 8th, so you must be watching Science at Soast. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and every week Science at Soast showcases some of the research which has been done by our graduate students and postdocs. SOST stands for the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology. And there's many different aspects of the research which we're trying to cover during this semester. This week, we're dealing with the oceans and I'm really pleased to welcome Nick Orm, who is a graduate student in our Ocean Resources and Engineering Department. So Nick, welcome to the show. Uh, I, think the dis I think the discussion topic today is going to be on wave energy. Uh, and of course, that's a really important topic for State of Hawaii. Um, we're trying to go renewable in the next few years, as well as uh, a lot of us go in the ocean almost on a daily basis. So first of all, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? You're a graduate student. Um, how far are you throughout your degree program? Yeah, I'm, I'm midway through uh, my fourth year. I'm, I'm hoping to graduate this uh, coming December or the following spring, depending on how everything goes. Um, I am doing my PhD on uh, non-power grid applications of wave energy, specifically for ocean observing applications and recharging autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, okay, that, that, that's a bit of a, a mouthful, um, yeah. but it, it sounds as if you're not trying to put kilowatts into the uh, the power grid for HECO um, and the autonomous vehicles, I would guess, is uh, a number of sensors which are floating in the ocean, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so in order to properly uh, determine, for example, uh, the intensity of a hurricane. Uh, you need to know a couple of things about your the top layer of ocean that you have and how much heat is stored in there. How is that heat moving? Um, and so current methods, we use anchored buoys that sit in a single location and you kind of hope that the, the buoy is within your hurricane path. The objective is uh, to make it such that you have a, a set of these buoys that function as sort of a lookout and they're able to get a lot higher resolution data in terms of your space and your time, such that we'll have better tracks of the intensity and the severity of hurricanes that could hit our islands. Okay, so just this one application, which you've introduced us to, um, shows the relevance of the kind of work that you and the department uh, within SOS is actually doing will have direct relevance to people here in Hawaii, correct? Oh, most definitely, and wave energy is a, topic that I'm, I'm particularly passionate about because it has so many applications to the state of Hawaii. I, growing up here, you know, you, you see a lot of the problems with being the most geographically isolated place in the world. And so you right. need to come up with a lot of solutions uh, here locally for local problems instead of importing a lot of uh, these technology solutions. Right. And of course, the surrounding ocean is massive around the state of Hawaii. So having sensors or instruments way out shore, um, presumably is a really important thing because otherwise you wouldn't collect the data, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. All right, well, um, I'm sure most of the people are familiar with seeing surf on the North shore of Oahu, for example, but I understand that in, in the first slide, if Michael, you can just show us the first slide, there are different types of waves. Uh, and yes. so, uh, Nick, can you just lead us through? Um, you've got three different types of waves labeled on the top of the illustration. What are they? Yeah, so when, when we talk about waves, you know, what, what first comes to mind typically is this breaking wave that you see um, in the, the top right corner there, that, that plunging breaker. But that's not how most waves look on the ocean. And that, that's not what we mean when we're talking about wave energy and capturing energy from waves. What we're really talking about is this swell and these wind waves. So swell is typically your longer period, longer length waves that you'll see. This is the stuff that's really great for surfing. Um, and when you look out on a, a pretty calm, not windy day, you, you can sometimes see these long crested just lines coming towards the islands. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about swell. Now, when we're talking about wind waves, those are waves that are generated locally. So the wave that waves are, are formed from, from a sort of philosophical standpoint, it, waves are condensed solar energy. So the sun unevenly 
uh, heats up the earth and you have this pressure differential which induces wind uh, and when that wind is uh, traveling across the ocean you end up having some of that energy from the wind transferred into waves which is what you get with the, the locally generated wind waves okay and and i understand that you're a surfer but uh, it would be the breaking waves which the surfer would be familiar with as yeah. opposed to these long wavelength swells and that kind of thing and then yeah. there's some some terminology at, at the bottom part of uh, our first diagram uh, let, let, let's just walk us through this obviously uh um surfers would be familiar with some of yeah. the terms but so landlocked people may not you have a couple of uh, characteristics to kind of talk about. You have a crest, which is the, the high point of a wave. You have a trough, which is the low point of a wave. You have what's called the wavelength, which is a little bit self-explanatory. It's the length between crest to crest or trough to trough, depending on how you're measuring it. We typically do crest to crest. Um, and you have your wave height, which is the overall height of the total uh, wave rather than the, just the amplitude of the wave. Um, and so when you're talking about the how you calculate the energy you're, you you do it in reference to these specific metrics all right and, and particularly the image of this ocean wave swell um when we're thinking about the the wavelength or the wave height um they look pretty small in the the photograph but presumably they can be quite large right yeah yeah and i mean if you look at the wave energy test site on the Marine, uh, Kaneohe Marine Corps Base. Uh, just recently, we had a set of it was 80 to 100 foot open ocean waves coming through. So they, they can be quite large. Okay, that's wavelength, not height, presumably. Uh, sorry, no, th th that's that's wave height. Uh, <laughs> wavelength will be much, lo uh, much longer. And wavelength is directly related to your wave period. So what's the, the, the wave frequency is directly related to the length of your actual wave. Okay, so um, how much energy is out there? I think your second slide actually shows us uh, a, a global map. Uh, yeah. I, I was amazed when I saw this illustration start off with. So presumably we're seeing the globe here with the continents in white, um, but what's the rest of it show? Yeah, so the rest of it is showing sort of your energy density, uh, this kilowatt, which is your, your unit of power, per meter wave crest. So when we're talking about per meter, we're talking about actually the width of the wave, not the, the length of the wave. So okay. uh, the wider your device will be, the, the more energy that it can capture because it's able to get more of a, that wave crest. And so what you're really seeing here is an interesting distribution. Um, and I, I think that uh, you and the audience can kind of clean this, that we have a higher density of wave energy towards the poles. And this is getting back to this, uh, fundamental and philosophical uh, viewpoint of, of energy and energy transfer is, you know, where do you have the most turbulent conditions? Where do you have the, the most violent storms? Well, you, if you think of uh, Oregon during the winter time, you have people who are storm chasers who will go up and live right on the coast there just to see these massive waves slamming against the coast. And that's actually... And, and this map, would hint that Hawaii is uh, fairly favorably located. You know, yeah. Where there's orange and dark red there, pretty close to where the Hawaiian islands are. Yeah, um, we're, we're kind of this medium wave condition where we're, we're straddling between uh, this really high ener ener energetic seas and sort of the, the calmer seas of uh, your equator region or your equatorial region. And now, yeah. Yeah. Now, will people be interested, you know, in the middle, say, of the Atlantic or uh, off the coast of Antarctica? Is that a viable place uh, to garden wave energy, or would uh, you really well, want to be close to where people live? And it depends on on your application. So uh -huh. fundamentally, with wave energy, you're just producing power, and what you do with that power is is the real kicker. So you can use it coastally and, and uh, to power residential power, commercial power. But for example, if we're trying to understand the Southern Ocean, um, you don't have a whole lot of energy options out there uh, in terms of uh, so 
solar energy, uh, you know, you don't have that consistently year round. So if you're trying to do something like observe the Southern Ocean, uh, you really need to be able to produce power on site, but not rely on solar power. Your solar power really starts to attenuate off outside of this tropical and subtropical zone, and you can't rely on it year round. Um, and so one thing that we're interested in is, and, and I think the Department of Energy is interested in, is how can you use wave energy to observe uh, some of these colder regions outside of the subtropical zone? Okay. So it's probably worth reminding uh, the viewers that when we're talking about wave energy, uh, you aren't competing with HECO for many of your applications. This is to sort of provide how uh, uh, small instruments perhaps are floating around on the ocean surface hundreds of miles away from land and you can't use solar power so you have to get energy from some other source exactly and and you know what options do you have out there well you have battery power you can have a diesel generator and have to carry around a bunch of fossil fuels uh, which can be quite expensive uh -huh. um, so that's why wave energy and, and, and wind energy are, are two really interesting areas to look at. But right. outside of just ocean observation, there, there are other applications. So open ocean, what other market activities are done? Well, within the state of Hawaii, there's this massive uh, marine aquaculture uh, industry, uh -huh. the, the marine fisheries industry. Um, and so how do you effectively do marine fisheries management? Um, the current methods use these fish aggregating devices and buoys where you know, they'll, they'll have an echo sounder, they'll have this acoustic way of, of measuring the amount of fish that are underneath them, but they don't know what the type of fish is. They don't, well, you can glean what type of fish it is. You can glean uh, what depth it is, but you don't know nearly enough information to do targeted fishing practices where you're able to uh, really meaningfully reduce your bycatch and, and be able to not target these endangered species. And so that's, that's a real issue of concern. So one could infer that there are different types of instruments that employ wave energy. I, I think your third slide is going to show us that there's a wide variety of, of different types. Yeah. Here again. Yeah. Can you just walk us through, Nick? Um, there's six examples here. I know um, that there are others, but uh, very briefly, you know, A, a to F, what, what yeah, kinds so of things have you seen? It really depends on your application. So what depth are you at? Uh, how close are you to shore? Uh, we'll determine what is maybe a preferential way to extract energy. In, in example A here, you have what's called an attenuating device. And the way that that functions is you have two bodies uh, that are floating, kind of like barges, that are hinged together. And the relative motion between those hinged bodies as a wave will raise one side or uh, straddle, the other will go and induce this relative motion that you can extract power from. Um, in example B, you have what's called a point absorber. And the way that this functions, yet again, relative motion between two bodies, two floating structures. You have an outside ring float that will go and heave relative to uh, a central spar, and you'll have a set of coils and magnets where you're able to generate, generate power. In example C, you have what's called an oscillating water column. Think the hole in a blowhole over by Sandy's, or if you were to take a bucket and poke a hole in the top and push it down in a pool. Um, if you were to put a fan on that little hole there, now as the wave is compressing that air, you're able to extract energy from the blowing air. Example D, this is an overtopping device. So the way that it works is as a wave hits uh, this large structure, you have some of the water over top into this pool and the relative height difference, similar to how dams work, uh, will have the water flow down through a turbine and uh, generate power. Um, and E and F are a different example of a point absorber. So you can have sort of this reaction plate where you have a, a buoy that rises and falls relative to, instead of a second body, relative to the C4. Or in example F, you have sort of this rotating mass where now as the buoy is shifted to one side, you have a mass inside that goes and will want to correct and will adjust um, turning this generator. 
so so what kind of sizes are they? Are they like a laptop computer size, the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, or you know, a ten-story building? It, it, order well, of magnitude, how big? Um, it, it it depends on yet again your power application. If we're talking about commercial yeah. power grid, uh, we have a device that's located at Aloha Tower. Um, it's produced by a company called Ocean Energy, and that one is another oscillating water column type. That one is 35 meters by five meters by eight meters, which- uh, Over a hundred feet across. Yeah, that one is is meant to be a uh, 500 kilowatt uh, producing device, um, which yeah. is a, a sizable amount of, of energy versus, well, if you're wanting to power some oceanographic sensors, your buoy can be seven foot by seven foot by eight foot in size. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends on your application. And it must be a hostile environment out in the open ocean. How long do some of these things, what's their life expectancy? That's one thing that we're really looking into. And I think that uh, a lot of devices haven't had sort of the, these multi-year tests. Um, in most cases, they'll be, anywhere between three and 12 months deployments um, okay. that you'll go in because the, the technology is still relatively uh, early in, in, in comparison to offshore wind and, and, and solar, but we're definitely getting there. So, so roughly a year might be a, a good expectation for some of these. Yeah, and it, obviously because it's such a hostile environment, you'll want to do inspections more frequently. There's a lot of things to consider. There's uh, you know, this is a floating structure. You need to make sure that the hull is is buoyant and, and holding water. There's the energy extraction portion of it where, okay, you need to make sure that the mechanical parts are, are functioning. Some things break because of just the cycles. Um, and then, the, of course, there's how do you have this anchored to the bottom? Uh, is, is your mooring line going to hold? And the mooring lines, those typically last a lot longer than uh, what we've deployed the devices on. Great. Now, before the show, you uh, gave me an example, which I found really exciting that you might be able to use wave energy for desalination of water. Uh, I think yeah. the fourth slide. I mean, this sounds really exciting for emergency relief. Can you explain a little bit about what we're seeing here? Yeah. So this was for a Department of Energy competition that uh, the University of Hawaii participated in with uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. And uh -huh. This is supposed to be a disaster relief scenario where you have uh, a wave energy converter that packs into a three foot by three foot by four foot box and you ship it to say an island community that's been hit with a hurricane and within 48 hours deploy this and it's producing fresh drinking water within an acceptable uh, tolerance. And we use this very large flap. Um, it's called an oscillating wave surge converter. That's and the top bit, right? Yeah, it's a, imagine that you have uh, a syringe and your thumb. The thumb is this large paddle and it's as a wave hits the, the paddle, it depresses it and it forces a pump to directly pump water through this uh, desalination filter, a reverse osmosis filter. I see. And um, it's a little small in the diagram, but it looked as if there was a pipe leading out of the bottom of that, that white box. Exactly. Right. So it, it provides fresh water continuously as opposed to you have to send a scuba diver to pick it up. Exactly. You can you can pipe it directly to shore. And these devices, like I said before, it depends on the depth. These devices directly take advantage of the horizontal motion of waves. Um, if we go back to slide one, you have this vertical and horizontal motion to waves. Waves fund fundamentally are the transport of energy rather than uh, of, of water. And so if you were to follow it, a water particle in a wave, in an ideal condition, it would move in a perfect circle. But uh, anyone who's gone surfing can can kind of understand that that's not how a wave works in, in the shallow water environment, in a near shore yeah. environment. It, it becomes squeezed and it becomes a lot more of a this lateral horizontal motion. And so this device is ideal because it is deployed in a shallow water environment and is designed to capture the most out of that lateral motion. It, it, it would sound an ideal kind of uh, technique to send out to Tonga, for example, following the uh, the recent volcanic eruption exactly. and disruption. Yeah, yeah. Do, uh, do you know of any other examples of this being used 
genuinely for relief work or is it still in the development stage yeah so we, we went through the development phase um unfortunately in that competition they the competition site that they chose was not su well suited for our device and so we didn't continue in, on in the competition um but we're looking to actually start building this prototype and testing it in a, a tank facility I, it, it's definitely not at the point where we can mass produce these and send them off to emergency disaster relief scenarios okay. right but now. Th this is being done in your department at SOST at UH Manoa. Right? Yes. I mean, that's that's terrific. And I think the, your fifth slide shows some other uh, kind of floating device. Yeah, yeah. Know. So that's that hurricane monitoring device that I had talked about at the start of the show. So oh, that's, that's, right. that's this is what my, my dissertation focuses on. Um, okay. And it focuses on a device that extracts energy very similarly to the Helona blowhole. And it's called Helona for that exact reason, um, is that we started off looking at, okay, the Helona blowhole has this interesting resonance property. What about the Helona blowhole makes it such that it spouts off like that? And can you- Why use... is the resident, the resonance just the- Exactly, it's, it's resonance. And so we, it, we, we mimic means that. What? Which means what? It, it's occurring on a regular basis yeah so for a specific wavelength and a specific wave frequency uh if you were to have uh say let's let's say a three foot wave you might see in a example where you don't have a turbine up to to nine feet of uh change in in that water level inside just because it focuses all that wave into a single point okay and, and this is your phd project right so yeah. the instrument Again, how big is it? Is it a sort of little small thing or? Uh, yeah, the, you know? the, the, the device depicted, it depends on your power application again. So for roughly on the, the magnitude of hundreds of watts, um, this device is smaller than an eight foot by eight foot by eight foot um, profile. Uh, not exactly allowed to give all the, the dimensions because this is a new so, project, yes. um, but, but overall. Are, are you physically making this? I mean, is it something that you yeah. go into an engineering lab and you've got a lathe or, or something which is uh, cutting metal and putting it together? Is that what you do as a grad student? So that's that's the, the end goal. And, and that's where we're, what we're preparing for. Actually, we're looking to go and test um, through this testing infrastructure in May. Okay this size device but previously you don't you don't jump immediately to this full size device so you start off in a bathtub um mm. you start off in a, a small pool of water and you make it one to twentieth size one to tenth size one to fiftieth size and you test it in a controlled environment so you can know okay this is fundamentally how it works before you throw something in the ocean that right. you have no understanding other than what you've done on a computer now you know you mentioned that you grew up here on the islands um I'm always interested. How did somebody get excited about this particular type of work? You know, what what did you do for your undergraduate work, and why stay uh, Hawaii for your PhD? Yeah, so uh, it it started off when I was at Johns Hopkins. Um, I knew that I wanted to work in real, either renewable energy or aerospace, and uh, unfortunately, I got really sick my freshman year and. Uh, end up not doing too well in a couple courses, but it forced me to stay back in, in Baltimore. And I was introduced to a company there that worked in wave energy. And that just kind of set me on that path uh, where I started on one wave energy project and then uh, ended up doing an internship here at the University of Hawaii. And as I was finishing my undergraduate degree, I was applying to all these different companies and they kept telling me, go back and get your grad, your grad degree in ocean engineering, go back and get your grad degree. And so I was going and applying for uh, different programs, and the University of Hawaii's ocean engineering program is is one of the top. Um, and you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to go uh, to some place that's cold and isn't that <laughs> when there's a perfectly good option here in the uh, state of Hawaii, <laughs> being back home. Okay, so do do you take a lot of engineering? courses or do you uh, go out on research cruises? You know, yes. it, it, it's an interesting department that you work in that seems to mix two or three different topics. Yeah, yeah. So you start off with your, your, your fundamentals of how waves work, uh, basic oceanography for ocean engineers, uh, floating structures, you know, 
coastal sediment transport if you're wanting to do harbor design. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a lab class where I was privileged to go out on a research cruise with uh, Dr. Bruce Howe, where we went to the Oloha Cable Observatory. That's the observatory 60 miles north yeah. of Oahu here. Um, so we got some ocean time. You get to do a lot of hands-on work. I was trained in scientific diving. Uh, so it's been a real wow. privilege and, and uh uh, and Honestly, what, what are your plans? What, what are your plans? You're uh, less than a year out of graduating. Um, you know, a, a, any job prospects or what would well, you like to be doing this time I'm, next year? I'm an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, I, I've, I've started my own company uh, kind of on a very similar note to all this wave energy research that I've been doing here. And, and my objective is, is really to uh, have the wave energy community here from a private sense grow oh, really? so i want to go and, and uh work on my company oh terrific so how difficult was it to start a company in hawaii as a student uh as a well starting a company in the state of hawaii is actually surprisingly easy you can do it in 30 minutes um the the process of figuring everything out is, is the kicker and it's it's been um really interesting being at the the university of hawaii because you know uh there's the, the pace business school uh, which has the um entrepreneurship program and i've gone through um some of their uh summer seminars and their business plan competition which has really helped me in terms of uh preparing for this okay so um the prospects are good uh leading Fingers on into, tw into 23 and it, is it a, a niche market are there many other students doing this kind of uh research or um are, are you on your own We've got a, a growing lab. Um, since since I started the pro program, we've uh, expanded as a lab to include. I think now we're up to going to this coming semester. We're going to have five uh, graduate that's students. That's, um, good. that's good. And so it's 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 getting a lot of traction. And it's getting really exciting. I mentioned earlier, Nick, that you're, you're a keen surfer, and unfortunately, we've, we're running out of time. Otherwise, I would have drawn the connection between surfing and uh, wave energy. But let me just remind the viewers that you've been watching Science at Soast. I have been your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest this week is Nick Ulm, who's a graduate student in the Department of Ocean and Resource Engineering. So, Nick, thank you very much for coming on the show. Good luck with the PhD defense and uh, good luck with the company as well. So with that note, thank you for watching and we'll see you again next week. Goodbye.